everyone and welcome to DC Daily. I am Tiffany Smith and it's Tuesday, September 18th, 2018. We have got a lot of news to tackle, so let's get right into it. DC announced yesterday that principal photography has begun on the new Joker film starring Joaquin Phoenix. The announcement also confirms that Robert De Niro will be co-starring in the movie. Other cast members include Zazie Beetz, Francis Conroy, and Mark Marin. Joker promises a gritty character study of Arthur Fleck, the man who later becomes the clown prince of crime. The film is directed, produced, and co-written by Todd Phillips and is set to be released on October 4th, 2019. Next up, we've got the Scribblenauts Mega Pack dropping today for Xbox One, PS4, and Nintendo Switch. This two-pack of games features Scribblenauts Unlimited and Scribblenauts Unmasked, a DC Comics adventure. This marks the first appearance of Scribblenauts on current-gen consoles. Players control Maxwell, whose magical notebook conjures his scribbles into real-world items for him to interact with. In Scribblenauts Unmasked, your DC Comics knowledge can pay off big time. Maxwell can create items like Batarangs or Green Lantern Power Rings, or even call forth his own personal Justice League with dozens of variations at his disposal. Next, get ready to grab your kicks and maybe even your lasso of truth. This fall marks the inaugural Wonder Woman run starting in California. From Sacramento to San Diego between September and November, DC will host 5 and 10K races to help fans embrace their inner superhero and superheroine. Both men and women are invited to enter the run that celebrates the Amazon's greatest warrior with awards for the top runners. Now it's time for our comic spotlight, starting with Green Lantern's number 55. The cyborg Superman Hank Henshaw has found a way to hack into the Green Lantern Corps power rings. And if Hal Jordan doesn't find a way to stop him, Henshaw could conquer the entire universe. In Aquaman number 40, we see the conclusion to the four-part Sink Atlantis story arc that features a crossover with the Suicide Squad. The Squad, Aquaman, and the newly crowned Queen Mira all collide in this epic confrontation under the sea. And lastly, we look at Batman number 55. Tom King's prolific run continues as he reveals that the KG Beast is alive. After his fate was left uncertain during his previous confrontation with Batman, the Beast returns and seems to have something to do with Mr. Freeze's recent court case, a mystery that only the world's greatest detective can solve. Finally, we talked yesterday about Steve Orlando and Riley Rossimo working together on a Martian Manhunter Maxi series. And Steve is so excited about it, he couldn't resist showing off another cover on Twitter. Steve tweeted, Hmm, they said I could show another Martian Manhunter cover. How about this gorgeous take by Riley Rossmo? We're coming in December, folks, from DC Comics with Ivan Placentia and Darren Bennett. Not to mention Chris Conroy and Dave Wilgosh. How awesome is it that he got the whole team in there? He shouted out his colorist, letterer, and editor, too. Dave Wilgosh needs to get a Twitter handle, right? What are you doing, Dave? There is so much to watch here on DC Universe, and to help us break it all down, let's check in with our resident DC TV expert, Mr. Hector Navarro, and see what he is watching. What's up, DC Universe? Today we're talking about the pilot episode of The Flash. Nope, not that one, sorry, I have to clarify. It's the other, the one that came before. There it is, that's the one right there from 1990. We're going all the way back to when George Bush was president. Nope, not that one, sorry, <laughs> gotta clarify. His dad, George H.W., <clears throat> there we go. All right, okay, we're talking about the pilot of The Flash starring John Wesley Shipp, and this pilot was kind of like a made-for-TV movie. It's about an hour and a half of all flashy goodness. It is fantastic. John Wesley Shipp plays such a great Barry Allen. The theme was by Danny Elfman. The music for the show was by DC legend Shirley Walker. Love the music, love the score. A lot of stuff to look out for. Look out for Iris West. Look out for Linda Park. Look out for one of my favorite characters, Julio Mendez, played by one of my favorite actors, Alex Desaire. I really love The Flash, 1990. The very last scene is really, really touching between Barry Allen and his nephew. I still remember it from when I was a kid, and I watched the show with my dad. So guys, the very first episode, the pilot of The Flash from 1990 is on DC Universe right now, so go check it out. Thank you so much, Hector. You always know what we should be watching, giving us all the good gossip. That is it for the news today, but now let's check out our second part of our three-part documentary series where we look back on the legendary career of George Perez. 
Crisis on Infinite Earths is the single biggest turning point in the history of DC Comics. The story echoed through every corner of the DC Universe, and no comic book artist could illustrate an event of that magnitude better than George Perez. Coming up with Crisis on Infinite Earths, the company had already decided with all these multiple Earths that DC had that maybe it was becoming a little difficult for a new reader to come in and get involved in any of the current storylines when they have to try to figure out, well, why are there two Supermen? Why are there two Batmen? You know, or, or, wait, wait, one, one Batman is dead. Who is this other Batman? You know, these type of confusing things. And as it turned out, it was coming out at a perfect time because it was the 50th anniversary of, of DC Comics. It's like, Let's do something really, really big. At that point, I wasn't involved. I found out about it, and I thought, you know, this book has my fingerprints on it before I ever touch it. I love drawing superheroes. I love drawing as many superheroes like, as I can. I made most of my career from doing team books. So the idea of being able to draw a book that could potentially have every single character DC Comics has created, even out of the superhero genre, Oh, I can't turn this down. So I volunteered. I would become part of the plotting later on when I realized it was so big they really needed another voice in there. Uh, but one of the things that they found out that as many characters as they would put into the story, by the time they got the artwork, they got at least two or three times more characters put in. Even if they were background characters or other people just reacting to it, said, no, I want to draw the DC universe. When I first started in the industry, I never had an art lesson, so there were a lot of weaknesses in my work, but they said that they kept hiring me, saying that they hoped my artwork would improve, but storytelling and comp composing a page was something that was instinctive for me. So that they couldn't teach me, that made me valuable. And the fact that I loved drawing a lot of characters and I'm willing to put as much attention to the background characters as the foreground characters made me unique at the time. Most artists didn't want to do those books. I thrived on it. So I became very valuable to them. And it was something that I always found easy. And I guess also because I love drawing comics so much that I wanted to make sure I'm worth the money I'm being paid. Because I'm being paid to do the stuff that I wanted to do since I was a child. I was living in Wonderland. I wanted to make sure that they knew and the fans knew that I appreciated the, all the good fortune I had by being able to do this. Uh, in the end, I believe I drew over 520 characters in that series because we did do a cover for a collection penciled by me and painted by the great Alex Ross. And Alex asked me to draw everybody I drew in the book. And that's when I realized I drew over 520 characters because they all appeared on that cover. I take great, great pride in that. I would have drawn more if, if, we, if we had more room. And my one extra contribution to it was the title when they were trying to figure out you know, what, what we're going to call it. And obviously they were inspired by all the previous crossovers with the Justice League and the Justice Society and all the different Earths that led to coming up with this concept of trying to streamline it. Uh, and I said, well, well, like Crisis on Infinite Earths. And thus the title was born. Even if Crisis had, had uh, not succeeded, I would not be ashamed of what I've done. Uh, that I'd be, I'd be happy with my work. I'm grateful that it did do well. I'm grateful that it helped you know, uh, my career even further. But uh, for me, it was just playing in the world's greatest sandbox and, and getting a chance to draw all these wonderful characters in a story which uh, had one surprise after another. I mean, the death of Supergirl became uh, uh, the touchstone of, of the series, one of the, uh, the scenes that everyone remembers, even though the first death that was decided on conceptually was the death of the Flash, because he was the first character of the new Silver Age. So uh, the fact that his death had to follow Supergirl, so, okay, we kind of blunted his death a bit because we made such a big impact in the death of Supergirl. But again, it's those little bit of one surprise after another. And of course, by killing off Supergirl, they said, okay, now no one is safe. Um, but it was a fanboy dream for me. I really, really just wanted to be able to draw all these characters, some of whom I would never get the opportunity to draw in a regular story. So this was a dream come true. And to this day, you know, it's considered one of the highlights of my career. And also the maxi series by which all other maxi series are judged. So like, uh, and we created a new term. There was never a term, for, oh, the post-crisis or the pre-crisis. We are a, a, a benchmark to, uh, uh, comparing, you know, what used to be at DC and what ended up following at DC.